Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the Curry School of Education, and thank you for attending the Curry Lectureship, lec Research Lectureship Series. I'm Jamie Drow, an assistant professor in applied developmental science here at the Curry School of Education and Human Development. Um, and today's talk is sponsored by VEST, which is the Virginia Education Sciences Training Program. Since 2004, VEST has been supported by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education. VEST prepares students to apply theory and methods from the social sciences to research on school and classrooms. Program faculty and students strive to improve equity and evidence in education. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Bethany Riddle-Johnson. Dr. Riddle-Johnson is an alumnus of the University of Virginia's Psychology Department, where she received her bachelor's degree before earning her PhD in developmental psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, she, is, she currently serves as professor and department chair in the Psychology and Human Development Department at Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Riddle-Johnson's research provides important knowledge about early math skills that can serve as a foundation for later learning, such as pattern knowledge and abstraction. More generally, her work helps us to better understand how children learn foundational concepts and problem solving, and what educational practices can best support this learning. Today we get to hear about how this research can inform early educational practices for low-income children to best prepare them for later math learning. Dr. Riddle Johnson will be taking, talking for approximately one hour and will leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussion or questions. Um, she noted that she is comfortable if you want to interrupt with any questions during the talk, so feel free to do so. And please note that any additional or personalized questions after 12.30 can be addressed via email as other meetings will be beginning at that time. Thank you for attending the Curry Researchship Lectureship, Research Lectureship Series, and please join us for the next talk. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, it's a pleasure I was, uh, you know, indoctrinated as a Wahoo a while ago. So actually, because this is part of your training grant, I'm going to, well, so I'm officially going to talk about this one line of research on kids' early math trajectories, looking at low-income children's math knowledge from age 4 to 12. This work's done in collaboration with my former graduate student, Emily Fife, who's at Indiana University now, and my colleague, Dale Farring, who actually started this project. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about my pathway, because many of you are students, and so um, I think it can be interesting to just think about how I got to here and um, think about those pathways because of this kind of lore that maybe you knew exactly what you were going to do since you were like 15 years old or something crazy like that. So um, I was an undergrad here. I picked psych psychology major um, pretty soon after coming here, although didn't come as a psychology major. And uh, mostly as a, as a student at University of Virginia, I figured out what areas of psychology I did not want to study. So um, I did research on child care. I actually worked on the NICHD study of early child care, and I drove to lots of parts of rural Virginia by myself as a 20-year-old and went into people's homes and did attachment Q sorts. Um, and then I also worked in an infant perception lab. Um, and so both of those things are really interesting, but not what I wanted to do is what I realized. I went on um, to get a PhD in developmental psychology with Bob Siegler at Carnegie Mellon University. And I actually started by studying changes in kids' spelling strategies because when I was an undergrad here, I took a class through the ed school on kids learning to read and write from Connie Jewell, who was here at the time. And we went and tutored kids once a week in the school as part of the course. And that got me really interested in that. But I became more interested in conceptual understanding. Um, and that led me to thinking about mathematics learning. And so, um, but in all my under, excuse me, all my PhD work, I worked with kids one on one, but in schools. So I was going into schools and pulling kids out of the classroom. You could call it lab research because, you know, I wasn't in classrooms. Um, but that got me really interested in kids' um, math learning. I ended up um, staying at Carnegie Mellon and doing a postdoc. And when I did that, I was. Um, what we were doing is we were creating an intelligent tutoring system and actually an accompanying curriculum for sixth grade, sixth grade math course. So this was my first time working directly with teachers and being in classrooms, as well as learning a lot more about doing modeling work, because I was having to think about how a computer could respond to kids' thinking. So this kind of was my first push into classroom things. 
And so then it was kind of a perfect position for me where I started at, in psychology and human development, which is actually mostly just psychologists, um, but situated in the College of Education at Vanderbilt. Um, and so I have lots of colleagues in ed policy and teaching and learning and special education. Um, and that kind of range of experiences kind of shaped different pathways that I went down. Is that me? So um, early in my career, I started this collaboration with John Starr. We have never been at the same university in our entire careers, and I've collaborated with John for probably 15 years now. He's um, now a professor at Harvard. And um, we got funding from IES very early in our careers to do this classroom-based research on, com on comparison. But in that, that early research, John and I and our research assistants, we'd take over a classroom for a week. Okay? So it was in a classroom, but it was short, <laughs> um, and then that led to two NSF grants on supporting teachers. Now, okay, we know this helps when you, like, we take over and we randomly assign pairs of kids to condition in that work. Um, now, let's see if we can help support teachers on integrating comparison and explanation in their algebra classrooms. Um, in this work, I just say that um, it is so important to collaborate. So I really, John and I, John is trained as a math education researcher, and if you seriously want to impact education, and um, I think that you can't do it with one disciplinary knowledge. And so uh, this idea of really collaborating, and um, you know, last week we're on the, we meet, we talk pretty regularly, and I was really frustrated with how things were going, but I realized like John and I, he always pushes me to think better and more carefully about these things, right? So actually, you don't want to collaborate with people who don't frustrate you sometimes because they're frustrating you because they're challenging <laughs> your normative way of doing things. Um, so I think that is really helpful. I know that here at Curry, you guys really are supporting that too, but that's been really important for me. Um, I actually was super fortunate. Vanderbilt also had a similar version of your VEST program, this pre-doc training program. It brought me top-notch students really early in my career, and that really helped a lot, and that was just pure luck on my, on my part. We actually have not been able to get our pre-doc training grant refunded, so we are not running that program anymore, but it was great while it lasted. Um, and. I got, and then I actually have an, I got, had an NSF Career Award, which I really recommend junior scholars looking into, um, and that's supported my work on algebraic thinking and explanation, and that kind of has led to my current IES funding focused on patterning um, as a form of early mathematical thinking. And then today, I'm going to talk about this total, like, bonus thing that I've gotten to be able to do, I feel like when I got invited by my colleague, Dale Farron, who had been, had been working with these children when they were four and five and six, and became really interested in figuring out how these kids were doing now that they were in middle school, and said, she was like, I don't know anything about middle school math. Um, they had been looking at their early math, and so got brought into this project when we got funding to, keep up, to like pick up these kids again. And, um, now we actually just got funding from the National Science Foundation to keep following these kids in high school. These kids are in 10th grade now, for the most part. Um, and actually, even though I was trained as a developmental psychologist, this is the first longitudinal research that I have actually done. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. But hopefully, I know I'm going to get to meet with students later, and I'm really happy to talk to you about these opportunities. I've said no to a lot of things, too. <laughs> Um, and that's also is as important as what to say yes to. But I'm happy to think about those trajectories because it's, it's um, emergent is what I think it is. Okay. Okay. So I said this. I've already said this. All right. So now I'm going to actually talk about my talk today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about why we should care about kids' math knowledge. This is a little bit of a signposting here of thinking about how math knowledge is re relevant for wealth, health, and perhaps even happiness. We know that kids' math knowledge is a pretty big predictor 
It's, uh, their math knowledge around school entry is a big predictor of a lot of things, um, including things like their socioeconomic status. This um, fairly recent study is both compelling and somewhat humbling that kids, this is just showing that kids' math quintile at age seven, how strong of a predictor it is of their socioeconomic status at age 42. Okay, controlling for a lot of other things. So you can see the more you knew about math when you were seven, is predicting this kind of one measure of um, at least earnings uh, and education outcomes as well. And there's lots of studies like this. This is just one of the longest spans. It actually also matters for your health. So there's evidence that people with better math knowledge are better at making health decisions. And if you stop and think about it, you realize why this is true. So you have to think about, like, is a 0 .001 risk of death bigger or smaller than a 1 in 100 risk? And there's this nice study, for example, that looked at, okay, this new treatment controls cancer in 40% of cases like yours. Well, 60% of participants misinterpreted this, and another 12% of patients just outward said, I don't understand it. Okay, and so um, we have to be able to process and think about num especially numbers in the case of health decisions to make really important decisions about things like what treatment options we're gonna pursue or whether we're gonna vaccinate our children. Okay, so um, math knowledge matters for things like our health. I'm a bit more speculative on whether it matters for your happiness, but it certainly can. Um, and so we can think about things like cooking and that, you know, I love this young math is tasty, right? We use mathematics a lot when we do things like cooking. Some um, mathematicians and mathematics is used in artwork and design work, um, and so kind of supports beauty, we could say. So in general, the case is, I think, very compelling that our math knowledge matters for things and that your math knowledge before or shortly after school entry is a predictor of your math and reading achievement across primary and secondary schools. And unfortunately, this school readiness, this math knowledge is not, it's related to the in your income when you're young. So this is just an example. I'm going to focus in on the math knowledge. You'll see it's not unique to math. But if you look at children from the poorest families in the United States compared to children from the wealthiest families in the United States, there is a very big difference in the math knowledge that they have when they come to school. So one, this tells us that math knowledge is not something that kids start to miraculously learn when they enter school, right? Kids are learning a lot about math before they start kindergarten. And unfortunately, at least for these test scores, there seem to be these big differences. Another, in some work by um, Nancy Jordan, has shown that this weak num number competency at school entry largely accounted for kids' weaker math achievement through third grade when she compared children from lower and higher income homes. And so, <coughs> When we're trying to understand disparities in math achievement um, in elementary and middle school, it seems like this weak competency coming in is carrying a lot of weight. In her case, it was her statistical model suggested it was really a, the main reason or the main predictor. So all of the, this has made math in preschool get a lot more attention than it did 20, 25 years ago. And I started this endeavor. Um, so we see this idea that early math is important in lots of ways. New York Times is writing about it. You're seeing classroom resources starting to talk about preschool math. PBS has web pages to help parents. Commercial software for practicing math, include, like IXL, includes pre-K math now. So People are really paying attention to math before kindergarten. But I think now we have to think about what's next. Now what do we need to figure out? 
And so there really is a big push to increase focus on mathematics, teaching, and learning um, starting in preschool. And this is just to illustrate, this is a really big change. So like there's some recent studies, not recent, if you look at this, it used to be when you looked at like first and third grade, less than 10% of instructional time was being spent on mathematics. Like this is the study of early childcare I worked on actually, I mean, it's the same network. And so these were including kids in Charlottesville um, around the country. First and third grade kids were spending 10% of time. Now there are recent observations that in preschool, math accounted for 25% of instructional time, so about 24 minutes a day in this 2014, and like at SRCD uh, two years ago, it was even 35 minutes a day on math in the preschool studies. So there's this shift that's really happened over the last 20 years in how much attention math is getting. And on one hand, that's great, but <laughs> to guide early math instruction, my claim is that we need models of diverse early math skills and how they might influence later math development. Because right now, I've been talking about math. Because that's what people measure, math. <laughs> but math is lots of things. And we have very little understanding, um, in general, about what that thing is when kids are little. We have a much better understanding when kids are older. So one research goal that I set out in this context was to develop and evaluate a model of specific early math skills that influence middle grades math achievement. And I created this early math trajectories model and I based it on the individual difference literature on specific math skills that predict later mathematics achievement. In case people in the room study kids early math thinking, I want to be clear that when I'm going to talk about ages, these ages are the age at which kids have sufficient individual differences in the knowledge that they could predict later things. It's not the age at which kids first start to think about it. So yes, some kids at two are thinking about it, but if you don't have individual differences in it, you can't be predicting anything from it. So this isn't, um, so that's important. I'm gonna break apart different numeracy skills. And then one of my mantras is, you know, math is more than numeracy. So I'm going to pay attention to that. Because if you read the math, early math literature, you might actually not think. They say math all the time, and all they're looking at is numeracy. Um, OK. So based on the synthesis of the literature that was out there, I um, kind of proposed this early math trajectories model. I shared this paper in advance. It's a child development paper from a year or two ago. But it really kind of from the literature, this is a kind of an empirically based set of predictions, that we would have this set of um, math knowledge in preschool, these three particular math skills, knowledge topics. Um, and then we have these early primary, so ages seven to eight, like first grade, kids knowledge that is gonna predict their math achievement in the middle grade, so ages like 10 to 14. I'm gonna walk you through what I mean by all these things. So the literature suggested there would be these three preschool math skills um, where we'd see sufficient individual differences that we could predict later outcomes from. So one is non-symbolic quantity knowledge. By that, I mean the magnitude of sets without verbal or symbolic number names. So like which one is more? Um, counting knowledge, which lots of people, that's the thing you hear about the most. Knowledge of number word sequences, but I don't just mean can I like recite the sequence, I mean can I object count and tell you how many there are? Do I know the counting principles? Um, so count to 10 starting at four, which is much harder than starting from one. I'm just quantifying how many these are and giving a verbal, a verbal label for that. A third skill that came up some in the literature um, is we might think about patterning. So by patterning, I mean identifying and recreating a predictable sequence. And when we're talking about young children, four, three, and four-year-olds, we're usually talking about repeating patterns. So you can do things like duplicate and abstract repeating patterns. So what I mean by those things are this is 
here's the model pattern, and here it's been duplicated. And here I call it abstracting. You're given the pattern in one set of materials, and you have to recreate it, the same pattern unit, but with new materials. And patterning is particularly interesting, or maybe not particularly, particularly relevant, because of the current debate that's going on with it. So this little graphic, this idea of it solving visual patterns, they say research says we're wasting our kids' time. Actually, what it is, is that the US National Math Panel, which was commissioned by the president and came out in 2008, came to the conclusion that patterns are not a topic of major importance. <coughs> Because basically because of the lack of evidence for their importance and the fact that five out of six of the highest performing countries in the world don't teach patterning. And so the Common Core State Standards follow this recommendation. And so even though NCTM and NACI always include patterning in their standards, they've been dropped. And most state standards included patterning, they were dropped. So you don't see patterning as a content standard right now. Um, but they were dropped because, fair enough, when they did this report in 2008, there was very little research. And so um, it compelled the need to look for that. So there wasn't evidence. evidence. Research didn't say we're wasting kids' time. Research failed to look at it. So we didn't have in the Common Core standards or evidence-based. So there we go. Although they kept shapes, <laughs> shape knowledge, knowledge of shapes and their properties, which ones are triangles. These are in all standards. People think it's important. I actually could find zero evidence that individual differences in shape knowledge predict anything. Again, there isn't evidence against it. There's just no evidence. So um, unlike shape knowledge, uh, patterning knowledge, there is some evidence by the time I did this review that it would matter. Looking at early primary grades, symbolic mapping, lots of evidence this is important. This is the idea they have to map between symbolic numerals, number names, and their magnitudes. So you have to match the numeral two to two objects. Just know which is more, five or nine. Calculation matters again. Can you calculate the combination or separation of sets? And it's important to emphasize, I mean, kind of three different things come up in the literature. The first kids really do this object supported. You have six pennies. I'm going to put Three more, uh, three more pennies under this cover, so you can't count them directly. How many do I have? You can give them story problems. And then eventually, the hardest is number combinations. What's five plus two? And so again, the literature is pretty strong. The symbolic mapping and calculation and primary grades predicts later achievement. And then there are two studies that actually were showing that this patterning knowledge in first grade was also a predictor. Um, in this case, of math achievement at the end of the school, the same school year, but also suggesting that patterning in first grade would matter. So it took the literature and I put it together, looking at these different, and that led to three hypotheses from the literature. The first hypothesis is that in preschool, non symbolic quantity, counting, and patterning knowledge would be important predictors of middle grade math achievement. Second hypothesis was that. Symbolic mapping, calculation, and patterning in early primary grades, so around first grade, would be a predictor. Shape knowledge, I didn't know that it was really important to include and look at, so we could get some evidence. And then this third hypothesis, more tentative, but I thought there would, might be a mediation process here going. It would make sense, there's reason to believe that the reason your preschool knowledge influences your middle grade's knowledge is through your first grade knowledge. <coughs> And for example, there is evidence that my, and my colleagues have shown that kids' symbolic mapping knowledge mediates the impact of non-symbolic quantity knowledge on math achievement. They were looking at the same time point. This wasn't a longitudinal study. But it gave support for this basic hypothesis three of mediation. Okay. You can ask me any time. Another thing that I got interested in is, would this be true for children from low-income homes? So the model was based on the literature that was either with children from more advantaged backgrounds, because they were convenient samples, or they were from kind of representative samples where they had kids from a range of backgrounds, but they weren't 
they were controlling for but not looking at um, whether these things held true for kids for different backgrounds. But there is some nice evidence um, that children from low-income backgrounds follow a similar trajectory, at least in overall math knowledge, as their peers from more advantaged backgrounds. And so based on this more global similarity, we expected that this model would hold from children from low-income children, children from low-income homes. And so I got really handed this great opportunity in this middle school follow-up project started by my colleague, Dale Farron. Um, we worked with a lot, so 519 students who had originally been recruited at the beginning of the pre-kindergarten year. They were all in Head Start or publicly funded pre-K programs. So they were all from low-income homes, and their children were predominantly black, reflecting the demographics of Nashville. All on, you know, kids are in the 10th grade now, so 11 years ago. Um, the kids were assessed at the beginning and the end of pre-K, so that pre-K is the word I'm using for that year before going to, to kindergarten, and again at the end of first grade. And then we got new funding to follow these kids beginning at age 11. Most of these kids at that point were finishing fifth grade. I should note and reflect above the sample. 14% of our kids at that point had been retained a grade level at some point between pre-K and when we picked them up. These kids are included in the study because we're looking at the cohort. Um, we just got funding, I think I already mentioned this, to follow these kids through the end of high school with some new NSF funding. But the analyses that are complete that I'm going to talk to you about today are grade five and six outcomes. Plus, we have state, the state gave us test scores from fourth through sixth grade. And I'm literally waiting for the data file to go to the, to these statistical models exceed my statistics expertise to start looking at growth models. So I can't tell you today what we're going to see about predicting growth in math knowledge across grades five to nine, but we're looking. So that's like a promise right now. Yeah? How many of the students were able to follow hmm. that? Or is that only one? I'm sorry. This is the kids we recruited. We got back in 519. They started with like 720. Honestly, I cannot believe. First grade, we lost. Funding was done. We were done. Four, is it right? Yeah, four years later. We try to track these kids down, and th I was not involved in this. The fact that this team tracked down 519 of the 700 some kids is remarkable, actually. Um, in part, it reflects that many of these kids stayed within the major large urban district in Nashville. They were very, I mean, they helped us track them, but we tracked kids into the surrounding counties. And actually, what we're finding is as the cost of living in Nashville is increasing, more and more of our sample is moving out of the city. But now we can, now we get to, finding them is a lot easier now, right? But it was this free consent. So we start with 519, and we're down to about 450 kids um, now that they're in 10th grade. But we had a 519 in the data I'm going to talk about. OK, so I'm going to show you this brief video. Um, this group um, asked me about coming up and doing essentially a TV spot. Um, and it was totally worth the time, so you get to see cute kids. It was like mom minutes is how they networks kind of show, showed it. So. Okay, so now you did orange. What comes next? Yeah. Are you sure? Ah. For Nicholas Ramos, Legos mean hours of entertainment, building a city, or even a train. For mom, Maria, it's a teaching moment disguised as play. I'll say, okay, you'll take one of these and two of these, one of these and two of these, and then he knows, you know, he starts learning about patterns. They're beads. They're just really big beads. Bethany Riddle Johnson is an educational psychologist at Vanderbilt University. Yeah. She and her colleagues followed 517 low-income children from ages 4 to 11. When the children were in preschool and at the end of first grade, researchers tested them on general knowledge and six math skills, including counting, comparing quantities, and patterning. They wanted to know if, among other things, those three math skills at age 4 and 5 would predict math achievement at age 11. The study suggests they do. 
the way that. All right. I know, I couldn't resist because his kids are so cute. <laughs> okay, so um, how did we come to this conclusion? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and also, yeah, but just this general thing that, like, I flew to D.C. for the day to do this video, and it was, it's, I debated whether it was worth it, um, but it really was, this idea that kind of taking advantage of opportunities to kind of, the, the target audience here is really parents, um, it was totally, they did an awesome job, and it was totally worth it. <laughs> okay, so, what did we do? Oops, sorry. Um, we have a set of early predictors from pre-K and first grade. We, they used um, the research-based early mathematics assessment, the assessment that Doug Clements, Julie Sarama, and their colleagues have done. I took that assessment and I broke it into six math subscales based on the literature. And we also had a set of measures of their general and cognitive skills. Then we have a set of math outcome measures in the middle grades. So I'm going to show you what each of these were. So here, is the early, here are the early math subscales and their sample items. So we started, I talked about non-symbolic quantity knowledge. So easier items are things like you see four dots and you see three dots and you ask which one has more. Harder things are like you have these connecting towers, six to 12 cubes, and you're putting them in order from smallest to largest. We have counting items. How many do I have with five objects versus how many do I have with 30 pennies organized in a structured way in identifying how many? I was really fortunate and happy that they have patterning items on the assessment. So they identified the missing element in the patterns. Easy ones are AB patterns. AB patterns are by far the easiest for kids. And then hard, really hard things like what's the core unit of this pattern? They had shape items. Um, select all triangles from a collection of 24 shapes. Some are prototypic shapes and some are not, so it really pushes their shape knowledge. Um, and then composing. Um, the harder items were like, can you make this complex shape out of these simpler shapes? There were kind of classic symbolic mapping tasks like here are the numerals 1 to 5, here are numbers of grapes, do a matching task or which is smaller, 27 or 32. Calculation with objects, so six pennies, three more. Or adding, you know, what's three, add three to 69, okay? So, yeah. So the symbol you mean by numerical symbols, right? Correct. Well, they include verbal number names sometimes too. So it's sometimes, this is, we have two symbols for numbers, one is our verbal label, and one is our written symbol, and this gets at both of those things, depending on the item, yeah. But non-symbolic meant you were just dealing with quantities and you didn't have to know verbal number names or written symbols to do the tasks. Yeah. We had a set of general cognitive skills that were measured. We have this narrative recall skill. Um, we use the Renfrew bus story, a Woodcock Johnson story recall, so you're essentially recalling this story. And these narrative recall measures have been shown to measure kind of vocabulary, verbal IQ, working memory capacity. So I use it as this kind of main control for general cognitive skill. We had their reading school skill, letter word identification. Remember, these kids are four and five. <laughs> um, and so it's a lot of letter and then word identification. Uh, Work-related skills, which is kind of a measure of attentive behavior done through teacher ratings. And then the same with self-regulated behavior. Again, this was a teacher rating, a uh, kid's self-regulated behavior. So we use these as control variables to kind of be able to focus in on the, what math is unique, what these math or skills are uniquely um, predicting for us. Okay. For our outcome measure, we, our main outcome measure was from the key math. So the key math is an individually administered norm reference test. We used three of their um, subtests that all focused on concepts. So numeration, algebra, and geometry. And we also used the quantitative mm -hmm. concept subtest in the Woodcock-Johnson 3. And I'll show you what each of these are. Sorry. So 
Um, numeration is things like what's an alternative representation of the number 253, or can I link decimals and fractions? <coughs> this is an easier item on the algebra assessment, connecting understanding to sets and thinking about kind of different structural representations and how they map on to operations. This is a harder geometry item. Sorry, I was just, I'm sharing you released items because there's some, it's a copyrighted test. Um, so this is a geometry item that's, for, that's harder, thinking about similarity of triangles. I'm gonna give you a little background about this sample, just, this is a little bit of an aside. But one thing about this norm reference test is we could look, this top line is age equivalence score, so they were 11, so you would expect them to be at here. Yet this is their actual performance on the three measures at age 11 and then at age 12. Okay, so what you can see is that these kids are about two years behind on average um, compared to kind of a norming sample and then it was the worst in geometry. So just a background about who these kids are, or not who these kids are, excuse me, their math performance. We also use the Wilcock-Johnson quant concepts. What does a decimal, the first concept, part A, looks at mathematical terms and formulas. What does a decimal point look like? What does this abbreviation mean, or ounces? Part B is number series. Tell me the number that goes in the blank space. You know, so skip counting, squares, okay? So it kind of gets at kids' number knowledge. This next part actually surprised me a little bit. <laughs> um, this first part didn't surprise me. The outcome measures were highly correlated with each other. The part that surprised me a little bit as a person who studies math is that the effects of early math knowledge on each of these different measures was super consistent. Geometry, algebra, enumeration, quant concepts. The pattern was the same. So it wasn't that like shape knowledge was more related to geometry and patterning to algebra. It was very systematically the same. And so the good thing is that it simplified the analyses, so we're just, I'm going to show you composite scores that where we, Z's, we sum Z scores across our outcome measures because it didn't, didn't vary by outcome measure. In addition to our measures we gave, we also had access to the kids' state test scores. The TCAP, as it's called, is a statewide criterion reference achievement test, group administered, paper and pencil, multiple choice format. These are test scores from before the state switched to the more college-ready um, scores, which honestly has been a complete mess in Tennessee, because we dropped out of the park. Um, but math is a range of skills, including the ability to estimate and compare whole numbers, fractions, algebraic expressions, identify shapes, analyze data, heaviest emphasis on numbers and operations. So I think pretty typical of state tests. So I'm going to show you results from of three different types. I'm first going to show you the fifth grade math knowledge based on our individually given measures. Um, I'm going to show you then what those same analyses meant once the kids were in sixth grade. And then we're going to look at their fourth through sixth grade math state test scores to see does it matter if you're predicting these norm reference measures which are designed to detect individual differences or these criterion references, which are designed to measure progress towards state standards, is it gonna matter? Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through what the results are gonna look like before I'm gonna show them to you. So this is fifth grade achievement on our norm reference measures. You're gonna have our set of predictors here, so the six early math skills. These are the cognitive skills that we were controlling for. We controlled for demographics and stuff as well. I'm just not showing you that. Everything, these are standardized regression coefficients. I'm gonna show you beginning of pre-K, end of pre-K, and the end of first grade, okay? And you can see their average age at those time points. It's true, when I'm saying fifth grade math achievement, I'm including the 14% of kids who are actually in fourth grade. Okay. And a few of these math predictors at the beginning of pre-K, we couldn't, we couldn't, we didn't have a measure of them because they were too hard at the beginning of pre-K. But what we do see is that non-symbolic quantity and counting knowledge 
were both um, good, unique predictors of kids' later math achievement. And at the end of pre-K, we see a similar pattern. Um, now we're able to, we have non-symbolic and patterning knowledge. We couldn't, we didn't have a measure of patterning knowledge at the beginning of pre-K, but at the end of pre-K it was there. And at this point, with the other measures in the model, counting drops out um, as a predictor. But in general, we saw general support for this hypothesis that non-symbolic quantity, counting, and patterning in first grade and preschool, at least at one of the time points, was predicting later math achievement. So next we looked at the primary grades. Um, honestly, I've never had data that matches my predictions so well before. So we found that, I mean, it was shocking, frankly. Um, patterning, symbolic mapping, and calculation knowledge um, were the strong predictors. You'll notice, and we can compare them, symbolic mapping and calculation are really strong predictors. Patterning is holding its own, but it's, it's not as strong. So again, this is supporting the second hypothesis. So next, we wanted to look at hypothesis three, the mediation. So first, you have to check. <laughs> And as we predicted, each of these preschool skills, we're each predicting each of these first grade skills. There's not a like um, non-symbolic, you know, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping. It's that all three predicted all three. And then when you have those in the model, you find partial mediation. So grade one knowledge partially mediated the effects. So the effects of the preschool skills um, were weakened. The, less than half the predictive power, but still significant for um, two of them. Um, but so in general, this idea that at least in part, the reason these preschool skills were influencing later math achievement was through their impact. Well, I'm sorry, I'm using causal language for correlational data, so I shouldn't do that. So the predictive power of your preschool skills is in part because it predicts your primary grade, your first grade skills. Okay. So this first study gave really strong support for this early math trajectories model. To some extent, it really said, hey, the literature out there who had never looked at the skills together, looked at each one individually, but were able to come together um, in an unexpected way. So then we looked to see when these kids were sixth grade, would we see the same findings? In general, the answer was yes. One interesting thing that emerged, oh, you might have noticed for fifth grade, shape was never a significant predictor. Here, in six, for predicting sixth grade outcomes, shape actually showed up in preschool, but not in first grade, as a predictor of later outcomes. And, but the same pattern, same pattern, and the mediation was basically the same. Okay? So basically, predict these skills, predicting primary, and then partial mediation such that the predictive power of preschool measures gets much smaller, but for several of them is maintained um, for predicting middle grades achievements. Okay. So replicated support again. And it was interesting here that shape knowledge was kind of showing up in preschool as a unique predictor of sixth grade achievement. Shape knowledge is something I'm keeping my eye on. That's how I think of it. And so then we became interested, like I said, are we going to see this for predicting things that schools and principals really care about? Um, and is it a different kind of measure, which are these state high stakes criterion reference measures? So I'm going to show you fourth grade math achievement first. Because we were predicting three time points, we just looked at end of pre-K and end of first grade to not have a crazy number of models. So I'm just going to show you end of pre-K and end of first grade, but same basic stuff here. The, the rows are the same. So just like an end of pre-K for um, our individually given measures, non-symbolic knowledge and patterning, but not counting at the end of pre-K, we're predicting their state test scores. And um, at the end of first grade, we find symbolic mapping and calculation, but actually patterning was not a predictor at the end of um, first grade for the state achievement measure. And I'm not going to show you all the models. There, I acknowledge there were a lot of models. Um, but we saw this across grades four, five, and six. The pattern was quite similar. Um, we found partial support for the hypotheses. 
we had already seen that counting, when you only looked at the end of pre-K before, shape knowledge did not show up here. And then patterning knowledge, that's probably my next thing, was it predicted in pre-K but not in first grade. And then we looked at mediation, same basic story, that uh, we have partial mediation um, for these preschool to fifth, uh, <laughs> I should have changed this, sorry. But predicting fourth grade math achievement is what these arrows are for. And actually it was interesting, by the time the kids were in sixth grade, we had full mediation of preschool knowledge via the primary grades. Okay. So that's kind of the data story. I've shown a lot of data at you. I don't, I don't have analyses yet about individual things, but we have some added urgency. I already showed you that these kids were um, behind and when they were 11 and 12, and the situation is getting worse. Okay, so we now know these kids through ninth grade, here's where they should be. You can see the gap is widened. So middle school math instruction is not helping these kids catch up. Instead, they're falling further and further behind. So kind of returning to my claim here, that to guide early math instruction, we need models of diverse early math skills and how they might influence later math development. Um, so I'm gonna think about the implications of what these findings suggest for what should be included in preschool math. These are tentative. I am basing them on longitudinal data that is correlational, although sometimes there have now been causal, there have been some experimental studies that support some of these claims, or some of these suggestions. <laughs> So one is that I think we need to be paying attention to non-symbolic quantity knowledge. Luckily, there's lots and lots of opportunities in children's lives to compare quantities, but I think it's something that lots of parents aren't really aware of and conscious of providing opportunities for kids to do. We can ask them to say, which has more in cards, even if they can't read the symbols. The card game War is something we've been looking into. It's a great opportunity because you're doing lots of comparisons. Um, kids love to share and they love to make sure that they're getting the same or different, you know, knowing they get different amounts. And so use this as opportunities. There's also this thing called approximate arithmetic. This is a visual of this game that Park and his colleagues has done where you're having kids like imagine putting things in buckets and then saying how much you think is there. It's not exact. You can tell these are big quantities, right? But kids getting a sense of like imagining putting together quantities. And so um, they actually in the study found that low income preschoolers who played this non-symbolic approximate arithmetic game, it was an iPad game that they played in their classroom. They had improved math knowledge. Um, I'm just looking this. Ten, they'd played 10, 12 minute sessions of this game, and at the end of it, they had better math knowledge um, on the team, if you care, compared to kids in the control group. So this, was, this is promising that indeed, combined with this longitudinal evidence, that we need to be not just to paying attention to symbolic quantities, but also to non-symbolic quantities, the idea that it kind of forms a foundation for kids. <coughs> I also, making the claim, that patterning is something that we should be paying attention to in preschool. Um, I can back this claim up with some um, evidence by Maria Papik and her colleagues in Australia that found that preschoolers, they did not randomly assign kids, but they found that kids, preschoolers who received pattern-focused instruction for a year had better knowledge of some number topics at the end of that school year and actually into the following school year. The kids do a lot of things like creating towers. Of course, they're colored, it's just a black and white photo, and um, create, they, they like have to recreate their patterns from memory through drawing, so they really have really um, pretty sophisticated patterning activities they had the kids doing. But I think our longitudinal evidence, some other shorter term longitudinal evidence that I have, um, and these other experimental work suggests that this was uh, the decision to drop patterning from the Common Core State Standards needs to be revised. Um, it's a living, you need to treat it as a living document. It was based on the lack of evidence at the time. I think the evidence is pretty compelling. So what does that mean to do? This is actually something I'm currently working on with IES funding. One thing I point out is that 
some parents, and like preschool teachers love patterning, and some parents do it a lot too. They do it a lot. There's a fair amount of concern that they're not doing it in the sophisticated ways that bring out the mathematical nature of patterning. But like teachers have said things like, they took patterning away from us. And so the idea is what we should do is improve the quality of the experience, not get rid of it. And we've been looking at ways to do that. There are lots of fun things to do, like lacing beads, like making patterns with M&Ms. There's this awesome Go Noodle video that has them making patterns. And they're singing, and they're dancing, and there's hand movements, and pictures, and words, all making these patterns. So it's a great opportunity. We're working on a set of tips for teachers and parents based on our evidence and others about what to do with patterns that you can make and notice and make patterns with everyday objects and movements. So clapping and stomping and leaves and pine cones. That we need to be conscious of the difficulty of the pattern unit. You start with easy AB patterns, like this red-yellow pattern. And as kids master that, you add in harder patterning units. There's lots of kinds of patterning activities. It's important not to just do one or two kinds, which is something Teachers need some help thinking about. You can copy patterns, extend patterns. So this is like extending, where you're filling in these boxes. Abstracting is making them with new materials. When I ask preschool teachers, do you do this, abstracting patterns? They'll say, no, but that's a really good idea. Unlike other things I try to get teachers to do, where they're like, uh. They are like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, it's really important to talk about patterns. The language we use matters. We're asking them to describe the patterns. We've actually found that four-year-olds do really well with these AB labels. Kindergarten teachers use AB labels. Preschool teachers do not, because people are worried that it doesn't help. But we actually have some nice evidence. My grad student, Emily Fife, has done this and continues to do it, that actually four-year-olds, the AB language, they can make sense of, and it, it helps them do it better, because you can think about the pattern unit. It's a lot more obvious when you're using AB language. And then also pushing that there are patterns in numbers. So patterns don't just exist in repeating patterns. So the classic five little monkeys jumping on the bed, one fell out, bent his head. Um, you know, you can predict how many monkeys are left jumping on the bed, right? So you can see the countdown sequence and the count up sequence are both patterns of increasing one. So there are great ways, and this is an active area for us to figure out um, better ways to promote patterning in four year olds. I want to think about counting. I think the basic literature, this isn't just our own work, is we need to. Uh, refine attention to more advanced aspects of counting. So you'll, you'll remember in our studies, we found that counting knowledge at the beginning of pre-K, but not the end of pre-K, was predictive of later math. And then some nice work by um, um, a recent study that found if they took the counting measure and broke it between basic counting um, and uh, like maintaining one-to-one -one correspondence, and more advanced counting, like the cardinality of sets, the advanced counting knowledge at the end of pre-K was predictive of fifth grade math achievement, but the basic wasn't. And there's work by other colleagues that shows that kindergarten teachers tend to focus their math instruction on the stuff kids already know. And like people feel really good about it because they're like counting to five and the kids can totally do it. But like they're doing stuff that most of their class already knew. And so the idea that we need to be focusing on the things that kids actually need help to push forward. And so counting, I think, is a classic example of that. We need to be pushing on more advanced. And shape knowledge, we just need to keep paying attention to. Um, in addition to um, the mixed evidence in our own research, the lack of evidence when I started this, there is one new study that showed that shape knowledge at the end of pre-K predicted fifth grade math achievement when they used this researcher designed measure of fifth grade math measure that included a lot of ge emphasis on geometry. Um, so I think it's just a mixed bag right now. But at the same time, there's some nice evidence coming out about the poor quality of experiences that kids get with shapes. And especially with non-canonical shapes, thinking about definitional properties with shapes. And I'm going to just show you an example because I think it's pretty compelling. 
So this was a recent analysis of shape books. Sorry. She found that 76% of the 66 children's popular press shape books included at least one explicit inaccuracy. And these are some examples of this inaccuracy. This does not meet the definitional properties of a triangle. Triangles are closed figures. Okay. This is also does not meet the uh, operational definition of a triangle because triangles have only straight lines in them. This is not the definitional property of a circle because circles are closed shapes. And these do not meet the definitional properties of rectangles because they do not have four straight sides and four um, uh, right angles. <laughs> so. Um, Kids, they're getting pretty crappy input as far as it seems to be. So it almost also might be that shape knowledge is not going to predict um, later math achievement for lots of kids because they're getting such bad input. Yeah? I'm interested in how, how this interacts with like abstract or maybe a more appropriate term would be creative thinking uh -huh. because I'm thinking particularly about the lollipop while it's not technically a yeah. circle it is circular and I would want yeah. I would want my kid to be able to, to, to make that relationship even if even if it, that that particular item doesn't meet the the academic definition yeah it's so this is such a hard thing and something I haven't thought a ton about and you're right on one hand we really want to tap your everyday knowledge and we want you to link in, and we want you to notice these things about the world. Mm -hmm. But mathematically, why shapes might matter is shapes have definitional properties. And that's what makes shape, honestly, I don't really care that naming that as a triangle is like not that mathematically interesting to me. What makes it interesting is being able to learn what distinguishes triangles from non-triangles. Like mathematically, that's what's important. And so I think we're, we're not helping kids mathematically. Now, that doesn't mean we're not, I mean, math's not the only important thing in the world. Totally agree. And I don't know, could we say to kids, look, this is like a circle? That could be pretty interesting. I mean, actually, near misses are super useful. Like, the, like, these are like circles. These are real circles. Like, I would totally advocate that kind of activity. In fact, we know that near misses really help kids learn definitional properties, because I study comparison, too. But yeah, so it's tricky, but it's very intuitive. Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about okay, something uh, uh, sort of like that if you do use measurement, like, for example, uh, um, baking pans, right? Yeah. So baking pans typically have, like, curved They edges. do, and yeah. when you look at the actual baking pan, there's a, a sort of squared off spatial measurement. Yes, with yeah. 13 by yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm struggling with how this, how this interacts with, yeah. with that. Yeah. And, and, right. and I guess the, the, the connection is when I start talking, when we talk to parents, right, yeah. about how you can find yeah. math in your everyday yeah. life. Well, this kind of pushes against it that. does it does I totally agree I think this is why maybe you could study it I mean I think the problem <laughs> honestly, is, like, is like we have this vague sense that shapes are important they're in I mean I don't know patterning got dropped from state standards and shapes didn't what just despite no evidence there's some intuition about shapes we totally need to build connections to the real world and we just don't know enough about it because honestly, what most people pay attention to is numbers, right? And so I think partially this just illustrates the desperate need for scholarship on this. And there's this real tension that you're bringing up. I don't know because I, and I can imagine with a first grader, I would really want to engage in this contrasting. And um, there are preschool cur curriculums, math curriculums, that do engage kids in this some, and they make some progress on this. Um, but wow, the trade-offs are so interesting. Yeah, and I wish we knew, and we don't. Yeah, great point. Okay, awesome. I'm almost out of slides, and then I hope to get more questions like that. Okay, so I have to give you this caution. Um, I think this study is incredibly important if you haven't read it. 
The bottom line is that longitudinal studies like the one I just talked to you are systematically overestimating the sustained impact of treatment that we actually see. So this work by Drew Bailey, um, Greg Duncan, and colleagues, they were able to look at um, kids. Triad is a uh, building blocks math curriculum and professional development that supports um, math in pre-K. And you can look at the impact of treatment effects, but every one of you in this room that has ever done or looked at treatment effects, what happens to effective treatment over time? It goes, it goes down, right? It dissipates over time. That's always what you find. I don't know of a single study. And that's what you see in this line. The impact of treatment gets lower the further and further you get away from when the intervention happened. But unlike that, when you look at these longitudinal estimates of the knowledge measures, the further and further out you get in predicting, and I found this in my own work, the predictive power does not dissipate. Your math skills at the uh, fifth grade, five, age five math skills, predicting age six, seven, nine and a half, ten, and eleven, are almost the same, right? So it almost suggests, like, hey, this kind of suggests, like, hey, if we made this better when you were five, then we would like fix you, you know, and we would have this sustained impact into fifth grade. That's kind of what I've implied through my studies. But that's actually not how intervention works. We know that treatment effects are never as sustained. And so I think we as a field need to figure this out. Like we can see these really high predictive stable predictions, but when we intervene, those effects do not last. We can bump kids up to the level of kids who get it naturally occurring, but it, there, that impact doesn't stay up there. It doesn't inoculate the kids. And so, I actually, I don't know quite how to resolve this yet, but I think it's really important for us as people who are interested both in longitudinal evidence and in intervention work to think more carefully about how this goes together. And I think it's kind of surprising that like this paper just came out in 2017 and I think it articulates things we've known, but it does a really nice job of it. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you my takeaways and then take all the questions that you can throw at me. So. One, this early math trajectory model is, seems to be a promising framework for thinking about the development of specific math topics. Two, that children from low-income backgrounds seem to follow a similar trajectory as their, pair, their peers from more advantaged homes, both from data that's looked at that directly and from the fact that I made predictions from this broader literature that held true for this group. That patterning and non-symbolic quantity knowledge merit additional attention in preschool. In addition to my longitudinal research, we have some experimental evidence that supports that claim. Well, maybe not experimental, but intervention at least. Um, we need to figure out more about the role of shape knowledge and how to support it. The influence of preschool math knowledge on later math achievement is in part mediated by first grade math knowledge, although not fully. But we really need more causal evidence as we develop standards and curriculum for preschool. So I'm going to thank my funding sources and happy to take questions. <laughs> yes, I know some of you need to go. Okay. And you sort of mentioned having this issue, and I'm just wondering how you dealt with it. We get some pushback as we try to assess more challenging skills at kindergarten entry okay. because they go beyond the expectations uh -huh. of kindergarten entry skills, or they go beyond, you know, they go to the first grade. You know, yeah. like if we give a kid an equation, we get like an incredible. Yeah. Okay. But when we test out those items, we find that some percentage, maybe 20 percent, maybe 30, 40 yeah. percent, kids can actually answer those. Uh -huh. Do them. So I'm just wondering that as you as you communicate with teachers mm. about expectations, yeah, you know, have you had opportunities to try to convince teachers that yeah. that we should do a better job of understanding what kids can do and pushing a little bit on what kids are capable? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually haven't because I'm essentially right now most of my work is like. 
hey, this thing patterning that you like to do that they have now told you not paying enough attention to, I actually think you should do it. They're like, yeah. Um, so I haven't been faced with it that much, although um, I can, if I were going to do that, I would point to this work by Amy Klassen and her colleagues that have shown, like, but I think my point is like, well, don't, okay, yeah, some of these, they are good at detecting kids who come into school being able to read. And I think most schools say, yeah, I need to know which of my kids can read so that I can help support their reading development. So, hey, guess what? Some of your kids come into school with advanced number knowledge and math knowledge. You already did, that's the problem knowledge. Anyway, um, and we need to be thinking about supporting their trajectories too. And there's evidence that kindergarten teachers tend to be focusing on the stuff that even their like lower, like their typical kids already have mastered. I, that, that came out of Amy Klassen's, some work she did, um, I think with Mimi Engel. Um, I think it's really compelling that you need to treat math like reading, which is that, no, we're not saying that we're expecting kids to do this, but don't you want to know so you can promote the appropriate, you know, I would use this differentiated instruction. Lingo is what I would do in analogies to reading. And I, I mean, I can remember someone, like my kindergartner was in the gifted program, and someone said to me, well, can she read? And I said, no, <laughs> she's really good at math and they're like oh like so to them like gifted meant your kid could read when they were in kindergarten and I'm like that's, that's you know so the fact that math was even something that you would be better at was not something that would kind of occur to them and that's anecdotal but I think it it's I do see it although I do think times are changing on another like the teachers I bet you know 20 years ago it was hard to get a kindergarten teacher to even care much about math so now they care and now we just need to get them to think more sophisticated yeah yeah. And, and I study elementary education. Uh -huh. So I wonder how much like we lose something because we work in these like kind of developmental silos of like early yeah. childhood elementary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was just in a meeting with a lot of elementary math people, and a lot of the measures they use to assess teacher knowledge are focused on numbers and fractions for the higher grades. Yeah. There's nothing on much of this. Right. And so like the changing the standards is one piece. Mm -hmm. What extent do you think about like changing curricula? Yeah, working with teachers. Like, there's so many things. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. So first of all, Doug Clements, who you'll notice is an author on this way down here. I mean, he's the person that collected the data, and then these are the people who did the fancy statistics. Um, and, he, and Doug Clements has a preschool intervention. And one thing they do is they find that they go to the kindergarten and first grade teachers and teach them about what the kids learned in kindergarten, teach them about they have a learning trajectories that think about the connections, and give them access to some software that they have developed, like math game software, that they do see better sustained impact if they, because you know one claim is like, listen, you get these kids' math knowledge up, but like we were just saying, then you go in and the teachers aren't using that knowledge. Okay, so that is definitely part of the concern. I do think the other part that's going on, and if you look at some of the literature, if you, if you look at the stuff that's starting to look at between person versus within person predictors, we are making, we're making most of our analyses look at between person, means individual differences in this related to individual differences in this. But then there are new, not, they're maybe not new, but newly used in education models that separate how much it's between person versus within person variation that's predicting how well you do later. And most of it, for something like working memory capacity, is between person and not within person. And it's suggesting that a reason we're really overestimating the impact of these things is because it's probably something more global that this measure is capturing between kids than just that working memory. Because if I just look at the changes in that working memory capacity for you and I use these models that let me look at that, they're not predicting you would see near as big of impact. So, you know, I started to get worried about this. I bet that's true in everything I just told you today. Because um, <laughs> I read about these things and I haven't done it yet, this between versus within. But I think that's a little bit of it. We're capturing predictors and controlling for a lot of things, but there's probably something different about the kid who figures this stuff out despite bad input, and the kids who figure this out because they've gotten a good intervention. And that's probably some indicator of 
you know, ability to learn from the mediocre math instruction you get the next year. Um, and frankly, if you spend much time in these classrooms, it's pretty mediocre. I, I'm glad when, I mean, like mediocre can be like better, it, like I've gotten to the point sometimes where I'm just glad it's mediocre. Um, and so almost like I think it's an indicator of how well you can learn despite it. So I th there's lots of things going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are, like, with the thing about patterning, yeah. is it that patterning matters, or did some kids get just overall better quality math instruction yeah. at these different time points? Um, yeah. Because especially some of the measures, I, I agree with your distinctions of like easier and harder, but they were all still pretty, in terms of like the, the mathematics literature, pretty rote items. So I, I just wondered if there was like an overall yeah, so first of all, I would take claim if you looked at these measures. I mean, first of all, they were developed by math ed researchers. And I don't think they're rote. Um, but um, I was super worried I wouldn't be able to run these models because of multicollinearity, right? So if these early math skills are so highly correlated with each other, I couldn't even run the statistical models. And I literally developed these subscales and said, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to test this because of that problem. And by... I, and kind of miraculously, I mean, they are correlated, no doubt about it, but they are, we do not have multicollinearity, at least from a statistical perspective, um, in them. Another thing I did not tell you <laughs> is that this study was, these kids were recruited for um, a randomized control trial of a math intervention versus business as usual instruction. And we got this classic finding where, um, at the end of pre-K, the kids who got the math intervention did a lot better. At the end of kindergarten, those effects were mostly gone. And by the end of first grade, they were totally gone. So I glossed over that. We've run the models controlling for that. We've run the models separately for kids in the treatment and control conditions. We see the same patterns. That tells me that in the group of kids who got a good, I mean, it's, a, it's building blocks math, pre-K math curriculum. I don't know if you've seen it, it's, I mean, it's good. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> So some teachers struggled to implement it, but um, it's good. And it helped kids a lot in pre-K, but, um, but it didn't make up right. It's like, you know what, good pre-K math instruction does not like inoculate you against mediocre math instruction for, and these kids are mostly in urban or public schools. Um, so anyway, I'm, ask, I'm kind of answering you complicated, but I am able to pull out predictive power, power. If you drop patterning, then shape knowledge becomes predictive in all these models, for example. So if you put them in together, patterning kind of carries the day. But if you drop patterning, so there is something about the patterning and shape measures together. But yeah. Something I was wondering about with that was when you were talking about the different examples of patterning and shape knowledge, and even some of what you're saying Make, yeah, it totally, the patterning thing, and Doug, I mean, Doug Clements, who did this, was on the National Math Advisory Panel and helped develop the Common Core Standards, and, that, and Doug and I have had lots of conversations, and he's like, well, it shows up and make use and look for structure. And I do think that that's what patterning actually is helpful for. But the problem is, like, all the examples are of more advanced arithmetic-based making use and looking for a structure. And at least in my experiences, teachers don't know. Your average, like, teachers I work with don't really know what to do with these mathematical practices. Like, you know, my daughter's mathematical practice assessment was that she turned her homework in. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I just, so to some extent, yes. I mean, mathematically, it's there, encompassed in that. And then when I want to sell it to a school, I say, look, it's, tapping this, but I think most teachers don't know and there's no examples. And so I actually do agree in the spirit that it can be there. But I, when you ask teachers, teachers think they took patterning away from them. They aren't making the connections in preschool and, kinder, well, I mean, there aren't common core standards for pre-K, but in kindergarten, you know. So it's a, it's a complicated thing. Yeah. Can you pull the thread on this issue of patterning? Because I've, yeah. um, I, I've heard about like, you know, people who don't use the pattern unit properly and, yeah. like, you know, and, it, and then it's supposed to teach this inherent structure. Yeah. And, but then like in practice, like what should a kindergarten 
kindergarten or first grade teacher do to kind of point out that make yeah. the link between okay this is yeah. pattern and this is how you use it? Yeah. Like what's the magic there? I don't know. Well, I think there's two different. I have two things to say about that. So one thing is that I came to patterning from a, a math ed perspective. I had on my it was a, a lovely part of my NSF career grant is they said we'll give this to you but. You need to have an advisory board of math education experts. And I was like, OK, I'll ask them. They don't know me. And then they said yes. And so I was incredibly grateful. But anyways, they were, that's where I was thinking about it from. And I, I, still am, I still in my heart and some of my stuff really think that this pattern unit, and I can tell you how I do it, because we're running an intervention study right now. But at the same time, there are people using these measures of patterning that do not go deep at all on the pattern unit. They just have the kid predict what comes next. And they see the same predictive power. Yeah. Yeah. And I created a measure that I didn't like as much based on teacher materials. And I thought, this isn't going to be as predictive. And I'm going to show that it's not as predictive. Yeah, it was just as predictive. Is it measuring something that's not really about the pattern? So this is something else yeah. that's going on. I am on. super worried about this. Or I think about this, I think about this a lot. I will tell you I have this IES grant where I'm looking at just this. So someone said it's just spatial skills. That is incorrect. I can measure a battery of spatial skills and patterning skills. And for preschool math, patterning skills are a much greater predictor than spatial skills, and you put them all in the same model. It's not and patterning and spatial skills correlate, but they are definitely different. It's just fluid reasoning, right? That was the next thing I became convinced, you know, like well, pretty worried about because you actually see patterning like things on fluid reasoning tests. Well, I mean, I use the fluid reasoning test for four year olds, which uh, for young fours, you can't use progressive matrices yet, but I use something from the WIPC that's not as, I don't like as much, but it's pretty good. Fluid reasoning, working memory, you can control for all of those things and you still see patterning having unique predictive power. So at least, Correlationally, I have been trying to tease out my third variable because I worry about that a lot. Um, and to some extent, it's shocking that preschool patterning yeah, is predicting fifth, sixth, seventh grade math achievement, right? I mean, it's like I couldn't believe it. I was like happy and in disbelief all at the same time. With all of that said, we are developing patterning activities that is totally doable by four-year-olds, really building on the building blocks pre-K math curriculum ideas. We're labeling pattern units. We're building, everyone builds a small tower that's our building, our core unit, and we'll build them on top of each other. A, this AD language is really helpful for young kids. Asking them to make about a new kind of pattern, showing them, oh, if you ask four-year-olds to show me a pattern, everything's a pattern, right? <laughs> No, no, that's, you need to start talking about non-examples of patterns, in part because we use the word pattern, like my shirt has a pattern on it. It's, it's a geometric pattern, not really a mathematical pattern. Um, so I think we have lots of ideas, and they seem to help these kids learn about them, um, that focus on the core unit, because that I still believe that that has got to be really important. Um, and we improve kids' pattern knowledge, but I'm getting these little indicators that like, oh, maybe it is, it's the predictive thinking that's maybe a more general thing, right? So we try to think, I now have an intervention where we teach you about repeating patterns, and then we try to link it to numeracy patterns, patterns and numbers, and I needed some verbal reason to connect those things. And so I'm like, just like the repeating pattern helps you think about what comes next, we're gonna look for patterns and numbers and think about what comes next. There's something about like, Yes, that's, that's where we decide to put our money. I'm not gonna lie to you, the results are not looking super promising right now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't quite, we, have, we did an early look for an advisory board meeting and our sa we don't have a full sample yet. Um, we'll have it at the end of the spring. But anyways, that's where I decided to put my money when the great thing about having to have a theory of change, which is like a big IES thing, is you're like, okay, I've shown these relationships, but now I need to like, I want to do an intervention study that shows these relations, and I don't want to do an intervention study for a year because I don't have those kind of resources. Um, and so I had, to, I had to make myself figure out those. So that's where I put my money, and it may or may not be there. And I put my money there with advice from an advisory board, which was super helpful too, 
But anyway, so yeah, this prediction might be a big part of it because you make a lot of predictions in math and learning. About, and as a note, we're seeing that patterning is really predictive of numeracy. It's not, um, it's definitely predicting numeracy knowledge in particular. So it's not this like separate strand that's just about algebraic thinking or something. That's kind of how it's laid out in the standards. It's definitely related. But uh, there's a lot of patterns in numbers. So, and you can think five little monkeys. Now there's how many? You know, now how many? This is a prediction I can make. Um, so. yeah. I have time for one more question. Yeah, Jamie. I wonder if you are planning to look outside of math in your ninth grade yeah. or 10th grade. Uh. So I, I'm just imagining that some of these ones involve patterning predictors that might be relevant to science. Yeah, so it's interesting. I will say that we will get state test scores and for science tests. But, you know, actually, the really nice thing about studying math is there are like these assessment, you know, what's a diagnostic science assessment for a high school? I don't think it exists. So, um, so anyways, we will know how they did on the biology end of course exam and we'll be able to look. But boy, I would be shocked. I think the, uh, yeah, the link is too far. Um, and to be honest, I'll be curious. I'm not, will patterning predict growth trajectories? I may, maybe. <laughs> There's no evidence to, you know, that can just be based. So I'll be interested. Yeah, so for science, I think it would be lovely. But science, is, as you know, as you take it on, is harder to study because, as I say, no one majors in science in college. You might have to in biology or chemistry. You know, whereas people major in math, it's a more, it's actually a narrower field, which makes it easier to study. And that's why I study fraction. <laughs> It's not easy, but it's easier than science. <laughs> <laughs>